Hello. It was 20 years ago, in 1992, that I first read poems by Mark Ford, and I wrote him a fan letter. It was because I had read them and wasn't allowed to review them here because those first poems were not published in the United States, only in England. But I thought, if I can't tell the world what he's like, at least I can tell him. So it was so wonderful to find a new poet that so immediately, was so immediately gripping. Besides being an entrancing poet, he's also an editor, notably of John Ashbery in the Library of America, and a stunning biographer of the enigmatic, not to say impossible, Raymond Roussel, the French modernist. He's also the translator of Roussel's involuted novel, New, Impe New Impressions of Africa, the one with all the brackets. Again, impossible of translation, but he translated it. And he's an anthologist of a wonderful anthology of poems about London, a hist London, a history and verse. He has two volumes of his essays, brilliant essays in many venues published. And all of these accomplishments and his professorship at University College London testify to his learning, but as we all know, learning alone never made a poet. We're celebrating tonight the appearance of Mark's selected poems, where he repeatedly brings about on the page that miraculous conjunction of linguistic delight, rhythmic undeniability, and precise feeling that we call poetry. Mark Ford was born in 1962 in Nairobi, Kenya. His father worked for the British Overseas Air Corporation, BOAC, and the family traveled widely during his posting to different countries. After school in England, Ford went up to Oxford where he gained a first. He came to the United States as a Kennedy Fellow at Harvard and then spent two years as a visiting lecturer at the University of Kyoto. His three books of poetry, Landlocked, Soft Sift, and Six Children, appearing between 1992 and 2011, established him as the best of a new generation of poets in England. Ford's poems often have a narrative pretext, in fact, almost always have a narrative pretext, with, with first lines guaranteed to joke, jolt any reader awake. I sit down here drinking hemlock while terrible things go on upstairs. <laughs> then you go on reading. So begins a poem called Funny Peculiar, which ends with a version of what the poet sees before him, a contour as yet wordless, asking for its verbal shape, needing, as he says, to be wrestled into its destined topology. Everything and nothing have become a circular geometrical figure, seamlessly joined to be wrestled innocently this way and that into the most peculiar, almost whimsical shapes. Ford's poems indeed take on the most peculiar, almost whimsical shapes. They're indeed funny peculiar, as that title says. Their ironic and comic narratives are full of brio with a little hemlock thrown in. The serial mis misadventures of the hapless hero attract menacing and melodramatic threats. A buzzing, roving helicopter eyed the progress of our orderly parade. It would swoop when necessary, a featherless scavenger lured by carrion. I don't think anyone has thought of a helicopter in quite that way before. Lar early jocular habits absorbed from the New York School, in part, Coke, O'Hara, Ashbury, mutate in Ford into a more sinister form of comedy in the arc of his Snags and Syndromes, the title of one poem. Ford mixes cliché. Ford mixes, above all, unlikely things, snags and syndromes uh, in that old figure called Zugma where um, the two unlikely things connect to the same verb. Ford mixes cliché, slang, and the boilerplate of contemporary commercial speech into a fast-moving current as he adventures expertly among forms from the Pantum to the Sestina. More recently, Ford has adapted striking excerpts from Latin authors, Tacitus, Lucretius, Catullus, Pliny, rescuing telling scenes, the suicide of Petronius, and various curiosa, 
Pliny's grotesque remedies from their embalmed Victorian translations. And throughout the poetry, there are recognizable flickers of autobiography. The Pantum after Africa begins with a pratfall into English suburbia after Africa, Surbiton. It then proceeds with nostalgia for the lost paradise of Africa and ends elegiacally, no Colobus monkeys, sorry, no Colobus monkeys, no cheetahs scouring the plains. Recent poems recall boarding school and youthful times in Surbiton, the latter in a new, a new contribution to that old genre of ubi sunt. Because of the unstoppable momentum speeding their surreal narratives along, Ford's, poem, Ford's poems have to be heard whole, beginning to end, as we'll hear them tonight, in all their colorful misery and funny peculiar joy. Not Ford. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed, Helen, and uh, it is a huge pleasure to be here tonight. Um, and um, uh, that letter was a nice letter to get uh, from Helen all those years ago. Um, I shall start with a poem. This is the most recent poem that uh, I've written that goes into my selected, and it too was sparked by a, a missive. Actually, this one was one from Colonel Gaddafi's widow who wrote to me. Um, I think I probably wasn't the only person she wrote to, um, but she um, was having some financial problems and wanted me to sort them out. Um, so uh, being unable to do that, uh, I wrote a poem, and, and it sort of um, meditates on uh, relatives of ex-dictators and um, new, new forms of communication. Uh, it's called Adrift. Colonel Muammar Gaddafi's wife, or rather widow, recently wrote to me asking for help in transferring some important financial assets from a secret location. Only I, she insisted, had the expertise to perform this complex operation. Is there a more ferocious texter than General Pinochet's daughter? I've no idea how she got my number. It seems that her fridge freezer is empty and her bedroom bugged. Now her toenails need clipping. Now she can't find her keys. A minor ex-mistress of Lauren Gbagbo's tweets practically every day. He apparently has become a serious fan of my poetry. She has a cache of uncut diamonds for sale, a terrible headache most mornings, and a fear of flying in any class but first. I'm just too tired to think of replying to this email inviting me to go trekking in the Himalayas with a distant cousin of Pervez Musharraf. <laughs> the gender of this cousin is unclear, and I fear his or her invitation is really a threat. You have reached 0207. My machine was intoning, but I snatched the handset from the cradle. I'd urgent business with a dude I'd just met, a cool, cool customer called Rafa something, 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 then definitely ending in Marcos. Um, uh, I'll uh, move on to a poem called uh, Natural History, a title borrowed from uh, Pliny the Elder not to be confused with Pliny the Younger. Uh, and um, uh, he uh, is a great source of interesting bits of advice. So uh, I was hoping this might prove useful to you. The first section I made up, and it's set in a kind of border 
uh, a bit of the Roman Empire that's suffering a kind of revolution, and then a character finds a, a, a papyrus set of papyrus fragments, and the second two parts uh, are, are derived from those. It's called A Natural History. John thinks this is my best poem, uh, so I thought I'd read it today. A Natural History. The river's ice closes, silvery carp whispered and scaly as dragons cluster and thrash around the piers of the bridge. Frogs, eels, water rodents die. On the bank, preserved like impurities in glass, a rutty tangle of wheel tracks, of paw and hoof prints, of sandal and boot prints. At intervals, I found fire-ravaged altars, some blackened, some still smouldering, pools of congealed blood from either an offering or perhaps a wound lay in the hollows of the uneven floors. Near one, I knelt and fingered the shards of a pot or water clock painted bright red and pink like a fuchsia, tucked up under the eaves of another, an abandoned bird's nest, fabricated in a curious manner from scraps of wool and brown animal hair and a few fragments, torn but still just legible, of papyrus. Now, the Magi, who are all appalling liars, believe the gods will never appear to nor obey a person with freckles. To one who has a fishbone lodged in the throat, they say, plunge your feet in freezing water. But if it's a crust that's stuck there, the remedy is bread from the same loaf rammed into both ears. Headaches are best cured, they claim, by pouring vinegar over door hinges and applying the resultant sludge to the temples. They venerate the mole and trust the entrails of no creature as they trust those of this tiny blind tunneler through the bowels of the earth. Anyone who consumes a mole's heart, fresh and still beating, will see like a prophet into the future. Avoid using a vulture's feather as a toothpick. For sweet breath, rub the ashes of burnt mice mixed with honey around the gums, then clean with a porcupine quill. Should you suffer from persistent pain in the abdomen, tear open a bat. <laughs> Beyond stretches a desert where flickering ghosts crowd round the startled traveller, then vanish. Nature would have us wonder at her ingenuity and creates men who never spit, who stand all day watching the burning sun journey across the sky, moving only to shift their weight from foot to foot. Some are born with two pupils in one eye and in the other, if you look closely, you will see the image of a horse. There are regions where no shadows ever fall, where men sleep but do not dream, where human skulls serve as water vessels. Those on whose mouths a swarm of bees settled when they were young will sway whole peoples with their clear golden words in later life. But no words spoken of any kind in any tongue can allay the griefs of aging or deny our racked bodies their final sweet release into oblivion. Sure signs of impending death include numbness, raucous laughter, mottled eyes or nostrils, fingers toying obsessively with the tasseled fringe of the bedspread. Um, I'll cut back to um, my very first book, Landlocked, the one which um, 
Helen was so kind to like. And this is a, a couple of very short poems from it. This is very short indeed. It was inspired by one of um, Ronald Reagan's more loopy comments, if you remember him, which was that 90% um, of the world's pollution was caused by trees. Um, I forget who um, briefed him on that one, but um, uh, this character has a similar kind of phobia about vegetation. It's called I'm. I'm an aggressive man, always walking up escalators and sniffing out rights. Sharks infest our local waters. You too I despise. Night floods the land. We must leave now. Armies of flowers advance, stealing the oxygen right out of our mouths. <laughs> Another tiny poem from that uh, era um, called A Close Friend, uh, a kind of uh, love triangle poem, I suppose. A Close Friend. She thought it might be vitamins I thought, rather, here was a man determined to waste his life. We met in a bar to discuss tactics. He's all right, she declared in a whisper. Quite brilliant, often. I asked her what she thought of his prospects. Quite good, she said. Oh, no, I said. Don't tell me you've picked up his stutter. Uh, and this uh, next one, also from Landlock, actually this one um, was the very first poem I ever wrote uh, at the age of 21. Um, and uh, I was living in um, America at the time and uh, I sort of woke up from a dream and wrote it uh, very quickly. And um, it's sort of become, uh, can't really compare, but sort of my Lake Isle of Innisfree in that it's the only poem of mine that sort of does go down well. Uh, regardless. Um, and I think it's, I'm not sure what it's about. I think it's a little bit about being an English person in America and thinking you understand America and then realizing that you don't. Um, and it's called A Swimming Pool Full of Peanuts. Uh, and you must imagine a traveling salesman somewhere in the desert states. A stifling blanket day out west. I was working the desert states, nothing for days, thank you, ma'am, door slams in my face again, so I mosey out round the back where my vehicle sits melting, I'll just check the setup, the outhouses, the grass is all stiff and plastic, the trees are all lifeless and there's no shade, nothing stirring until I come across, right in the open, a whole swimming pool full of peanuts, I think I've gone mad, so I shut my eyes and I count to five and look again, and they're still resting there, very quietly, an inch or so, I suppose, below the high water mark. They're a light tan colour, and the tiles around are a lovely cool aqua blue, only there's no water, just these peanuts. Well, this is a hoax. I can tell some monkey's idea of a good joke for who'd fill up a fair-sized swimming pool entirely with peanuts, unless they're painted in, which case it's a nice piece of work. So I kneel down in my best suit on the edge, tie at half-mast because of the heat, and with a loud snigger, I dip in my finger just to see it sinks into small, grainy nuggets, sand-coated and a bit greasy, some whole, some in half, I draw it out and examine it, all shiny with oil, the nail gleaming, and I lick it to find out the taste. Salt, madness, the genuine article, straight salted peanuts. This gets me, because what kind of mad case goes to the trouble of building a swimming pool and then fills it instead of with water with salted peanuts right up to the brim? I'm the butt of his jest. This goop is taking the Michael. 
Almost physically, I can feel him pulling my leg, so I lean over again and lower my head carefully until my left eye is level with the glistening expanse. For no reason, I'm feeling all queasy. This pool full of peanuts is disturbing. My eye won't focus in case in an instant they turn into piranha fish and green mambas or anything else that might be hiding down there. Still nothing moved. I admit it was quiet, too quiet. All I could hear was my own laboring breath. So in both clammy hands, I scoop up fistful after fistful and I watch them trickle through my fingers and glitter in the sun. I go back to my car and open up the trunk. I take out my golf bag. I select a nine iron and without a thought for my own safety, I head back to the pool and I swing away reckless in that peanut bunker. I scatter peanuts like a madman all over around there. They go flying like sand flies in all directions. Like golf balls, they arc away and shower down like buff-coloured hail. And I thresh and flail like one possessed but nothing is uncovered, it's no good from the edge. So feet first, I leap in at the deep end, brandishing my golf club and hit away like a good soldier. But there's more and more always, though I swing a good hour. At the end of that, I'm exhausted and my skin itches from the salt and my clothes are all clinging. I collapse in the middle, buoyed up by the peanuts. The whole thing is hopeless. My paws are all clogged, so I say, let sleeping dogs lie. And I crawl to the side and haul myself out and shake out the loose peanuts from the creases of my suit. I pick them out of my socks and empty out my shoes. I brush them out of my armpits and angrily I throw my nine iron into the middle of the pool where it sinks without trace and I storm back to my car, and I make this resolution. Never ever, if you can ever avoid it, fool around with a swimming pool like this one. Well, a swimming pool full of peanuts is not worth the trouble. <laughs> and that, I like to say, is my philosophy of life in a nutshell. Um, uh, my first book, uh, Landlocked, I um, noticed when I sort of went through it, I was tr trying to work out what to write next. I noticed it had no allusions in it at all. Uh, and I looked back through modern poetry to the works of such as T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound, and I realised I was going to get nowhere if I didn't include some allusions. Um, so I thought I'd write a poem which had almost all allusions. I'd also done a lot of travelling as a young person, and I'd never included many references to cities, uh, so I thought I'd write a poem with lots of travel stuff in it to impress on people my cosmopolitan activities. I also realised there was no poem which uh, captured the social embarrassment of mixing up people with uh, the same surname but different Christian names, which happens to us frequently, I think. People like um, uh, George and T.S. Eliot or... Um, uh, well, that's a good example, isn't it? Um, uh, so, that poem, this poem, very short, but addresses all those issues. Um, and um, it's called Early to Bed, Early to Rise. It was in Berlin you mixed up John and J.J. Kale, and we found ourselves watching Jacques Tourneur's Out of the Past yet again. I, on the other hand, confused Tenier the Elder and Tenier the Younger in Amsterdam, where I saw Terry Gilliam's 12 Monkeys on my own. On the outskirts of Moscow, we failed to distinguish clearly between Charles and Burl Ives. <laughs> Our punishment was to sit through Sergei Eisenstein's Ivan the Terrible, parts one and two, twice. <laughs> I met a man in New York who couldn't tell the difference between George and Zbigniew Herbert. His favourite film 
was Kenji Mitsuguchi's Ugetsu Monogatari, which he insisted we see together. In Cardiff, I confounded Edward, Dylan, and R.S. Thomas. To get over my embarrassment, I went to a performance of Jean-Luc Godard's Alphaville. People continually mistake the work of Antoine Lenin for that of his brother Louis, even in Los Angeles, where most films are made, including Doug Lyman's Swingers, which I recently saw for the first time and really enjoyed. I should say that gets in all my movie references in one poem as well. That was another nail I was hitting on the head then. But um, after I'd got going with the illusions business, uh, there had been no stopping me. And um, I am um, sort of un, uh, unrestrained in that area. And I'm going to read three poems which deal with, um, have references to other writers. I, I felt it was cheating when I was younger, but as I have got older, I've realised, well, it probably is cheating, but I haven't got anything else to write about. Um, uh, and this one is called, appropriately for New York, it's about Walt Whitman. This is called Six Children. Um, and Walt Whitman had a lot of British admirers. Um, in fact, if you ever go to Bolton, Bolton in, in the north of England, go to the local library and you can see Whitman's own canary, um, which um, some Whitman admirers um, uh, received from Whitman as a kind of tribute. Uh, dead, obviously. Um, uh, when it died, he had it stuffed and sent over. Uh, and there's also a beautifully designed loving cup from which they would all drink on Whitman's birthday and sing hymns to Whitman. Um, and uh, there's an uh, interesting archive, the, these Bolton Whitmanians, and someone connected with the Bolton Whitmanians who was gay wrote to Whitman and said, um, aren't you, um, all these references to adhesiveness and male affection, are you a little, um, uh, and Whitman was outraged. And he wrote back saying not only was the idea appalling, but that he had six children by six different women uh, in his youth, where he was jolly bodily, as he put it. Um, now, if you, anyone here knows uh, about these, these six children, can identify them, uh, they would be doing something that Whitmanians have failed to do. Anyway, I thought it might be interesting to imagine Walt's getting of these six children. Um, and um, a few references you'll know. Whitman liked opera and also uh, wounded soldiers. Um, that's probably all you need to know. Six children. Uh, the epigraph is from this letter. Though unmarried, I have had six children. Walt Whitman. The first woman I ever got with child wore calico in Carolina. She was hoeing beans. As a languorous breeze, I caressed her loins until her hoe lay abandoned in the furrow. <laughs> the second was braving the tumultuous seas that encircle this fish-shaped isle. By the time a sudden riptide tore her from my grasp, she had known the full power of Palmanoch. One matron I waylaid, or was it she who waylaid me on a tram that shook and rattled and rang from Battery Park to Washington Heights and back? Oh, Pocahontas, you died as Rebecca Rolfe and are buried in Gravesend, your distant descendant, her swollen belly taut as a drum, avoids my eye and that of other menfolk. While my glorious diva hurls her enraptured soul to the gods, I sit, dove-like, brooding in the stalls. What in me is vast, dark and abysmal, her voice illumines and makes pregnant. Someday, all together, we will stride the open road, wheeling in an outsized pram, my sixth, this broken, mustachioed soldier whose wounds I bind up nightly. His mother, I forget. Uh, another 
a poem about one of my favorite uh, American poets, um, Hart Crane. This is in the form of a letter written to a literary paper. And um, I think all you need to know is that he was christened Harold Hart Crane, but um, uh, he took his mother's maiden name Hart um, after his parents split. So it's called The Death of Hart Crane. It's in prose. Sir, Madam, I was intrigued by the letter from a reader in your last issue that recounted his meeting in a bar in Greenwich Village in the mid-60s, a woman who claimed to have been a passenger on the Orizaba on the voyage the boat made from Vera Cruz to New York in April of 1932, a voyage that the poet Hart Crane never completed. According to her, Crane was murdered and thrown overboard by sailors after a night of such rough sex that they became afraid, surely wrongly, that he might have them arrested when the boat docked in Manhattan. This reminded me of a night in the early 70s on which I too happened to be drinking in a bar in Greenwich Village. I got talking to an elderly man called Harold occupying an adjacent booth. And when the conversation touched on poetry, he explained somewhat shyly that he had himself published two collections a long time ago, one called White Buildings in 1926 and the other The Bridge in 1930. I asked if he'd written much since. Oh, plenty, he replied. A lot of it much better than my early effusions. I expressed an interest in seeing this work, and he invited me back to an apartment on McDougal Street. Here, the evening turns somewhat hazy. I could hear the galloping strains of Ravel's bolero turned up loud as Harold fumbled for his keys. Clearly, some sort of party was in progress. At that moment, the door was opened from within by another man in his 70s who exclaimed happily, heart and friend, come in. The room was full of men in their 70s, all, or so it seemed, called either heart or Harold. The apartment's walls were covered with Aztec artifact, artifacts and its floors with Mexican carpets. It dawned on me then that Hart Crane had not only somehow survived his supposed death by water, but that his vision of an America of the like-minded was being fulfilled that very night, as it was perhaps every night in this apartment on McDougal Street. At the same instant, I realized that it was I, an absurd doubting Thomas, brought face to face with a miracle who deserved to be devoured by sharks. Yours faithfully, name and address withheld. Um, this last one um, it is derived from the poetry of Sappho in this run of um, poems that make use of other people's writings. It's called Fragments. Obviously, um, not to be confused with John's great fragment um, from the Double Dream of Spring, this is a um, villanelle fragments. When dawn, wearing golden sandals, awoke me, I began to crawl, burning, shivering, to my uncurtained window. My grating birds streamed over the dark sea. Who can quench the ingenious fires of cruelty? I was dreaming of white fetlocked horses conferring in a meadow when dawn, wearing golden sandals, awoke me. On my stopped loom, a sort of landscape, icy peaks serrated as daggers, a corpse and beside it a crow and migrating birds streaming over the dark sea. Fat autumnal flies alight on my sheets, rainbow-hued, dizzy. This one on my wrist, its mandibles quiver, its gibbous eyes glow. Then dawn, wearing golden sandals, awoke me. Merciless daughter of Zeus, immortal Aphrodite, come to me, sing to me, low-voiced in sorrow, 
of migrating birds that stream over the dark sea. Cast aside your spangled headband. In my mirror I see you beneath these stringy locks, puckered lips and tear-stained cheeks. Go, migrating birds, stream over the dark sea, and dawn wearing golden sandals. Awake me. Uh, another formal one, or, or in a form which um, John has made brilliant use of, the pond tomb, um, and I think he's also commented uh, that it's a great form because you get twice as much poem for your money, or for your effort, rather, uh, in that um, lines um, two and four become one and three. This is rather beginning of a, a few graphical poems. As Helen mentioned, I was born in Africa, but then moved to a place which is exactly what its name suggests. Um, after Africa, after Africa, Surbiton, an unheated house and flagstone pavements, no colobus monkeys, no cheetahs scouring the plains, verrucas and weeping blisters ravaged our feet, an unheated house and flagstone pavements and snow falling through the halos of street lamps, Verrucas and weeping blisters ravaged our feet, but the shavings made by our carpenter, Chippy, were as soft as bougainvillea flowers, or snow falling through the halos of street lamps. Everyone was pale, pale or grey, as pale or grey as the shavings made by our carpenter, Chippy, which were soft as bougainvillea flowers. Red African dust spilled from the wheels of our toy trucks and cars. Everyone was pale, pale or grey, as pale or grey as the faded carpet on which red African dust spilled from the wheels of our toy trucks and cars. Real traffic roared outside. A faded carpet on which everything seemed after Africa. Surbiton's real traffic roared outside. No colobus monkeys, no cheetahs scouring the plains. Last time I went to Surbiton, that was still the case. Um, uh, a couple more. Um, actually, for this one, you have to know that a, a joke, or at the beginning, that joke, a kid's joke about, um, what's a pirate's favourite letter? R. Uh, it's called World Enough. Uh, and this is set we, after Surbiton, we moved to Sri Lanka, which was a bit more exotic. Uh, this is set in Colombo in Sri Lanka, called World Enough. It's a kind of, uh, I've been reflecting on my neo-colonial upbringing. I, I think I'm neo-something, um, which is always, everyone's neo-something these days, um, uh, or post-something, anyway near or post-colonial. Um, this is called World Enough. Yo-ho, haul high the Jack or the Jolly R R Roger, however tattered and torn, but also remove a pirate's favourite letter, turning friend to fiend and fright to fight. The empire was flummoxed and dissolving fast when we set sail on the seven seas, late, late buccaneers in quest of whatever booty remained, a retinue of bearers, a bare-footed gardener, light cheese and lime juice and papaya brought to us on the veranda, a chauffeur in a crisp white shirt with pleats and pockets and epaulettes. My sister wept when David an aging, impassive servant, dismissed for getting filthy drunk on Arak, returned red-eyed to retrieve a cushion he'd forgotten. I watched him adjust his bundle, rise, then stagger off again, his wispy grey hair coming loose from its bun. No more dusting of ebony heads from Nigeria, onyx elephants, Sphinxes carved out of soapstone, our gaudy, bug-eyed demon masks, 
or the glass protecting seven saffron robed Maasai warriors leaning on their spears in a clearing at midnight, a moon landing souvenir mug, a slab of agate on a Chinese chest, my pen holder made from the hide of a lion. Uh, living in these far-flung places, I um, went to boarding school at an early age, eight. Actually, this is a slightly topical poem in that the school I went to has just been exposed as, uh, while I was there, as many of the masters there were um, kind of hum uh, paedophiles, ped basically. Um, uh, I knew something weird was going on, and this poem testifies to that. Um, but I didn't know how weird until the story broke last week in the Times in... Uh, it's called In Loco Parentis. It goes into the title goes into the poem. In Loco Parentis were some quite creepy men. One used to lie down on the day room floor, then get us all to pile on top of him. And a basilisk eyed matron in a blue uniform with a watch dangling beneath her right collarbone. Thump, thump, thump went her footsteps, making the asbestos ceiling tiles shiver, and me want to hide or run like a rabbit in a fire. What we lost, we lost forever. A minor devil played at chess with us, forcing the pieces to levitate and hover, flourishing swords in mid-air. I'd grasp them now, the orotund bishop the stealthy knight, the all-knowing queen, but they dissolve in my fingers, refuse to return to the board, to their squares. Um, and I'll, I'll finish with a couple of poems. Sorry, I, um, was that you wanting me to go? No. Uh, I, I was going to read two more, if that's okay. They're not that long. I've, uh, I'll, I'll read them as fast as I can. They're, they're both, um, they're both um, uh, sort of set on the streets, one on the streets of Boston, one on the streets of London. Um, and um, uh, yes, I, I, I um, lived in Boston for a while, um, uh, and this happened to me there. Um, it's tougher times than I think... Uh, uh, actually, the, the title of this, Showtime, um, comes from uh, the Pixar movie, The Incredibles. Every time Mr. Incredible sees some action's about to happen, he says, Showtime, uh, and goes into action, which is what I don't quite manage to do in this poem. Uh, showtime. Tempus fugit, every sundial proclaims, yet over and over, time seems to swoon or to expand, even to grind to a juddering halt when I blog. A dreadful day online, I think I mean, is a dreadful day forever. My current screen saver is a sniper's eye view of a traffic warden leaning back to photograph an illegally parked car. Hatchet-faced tax inspectors invade my dreams. We need you to live they murmur as they pass, lips nearing, even brushing my helpless ear. In what wrinkle, in what furrow or fissure lurks the longing to make the worst happen? As if I had conjured them, one Halloween, two hooded figures loomed above me on a bridge I was dawdling across in downtown Boston. Their cradled half bricks crashed con brio with energy and purpose into my swirling stream of thoughts. Treats for the favoured few, endless tricks for the others. Travelling by water is best because you never have to go uphill. I lay prone a while, then springing to life into action, I fled. Something my heart boomed and echoed like pursuing footsteps on asphalt. Leafed 
a voice shouted in a comic French accent, Up your ass! Laughter. Don't stop, don't stop till you get enough. Are you, I recall, demanding of a friendly paramedic as he shone his pencil torch deep into my eyes, an electric light bulb, and, if so, what wattage? No one I met seemed to know about soldier ants, about how their jaws, or maybe their claws, are used in Africa to stitch up wounds. Discharged with a warning, how quietly I crept home through the mazy, moonlit streets of Roxbury, avoiding alleys and skips, my scars stinging like unwisely acquired tattoos. Halloween was over. High above rows of ghostly buildings, hollowed out by descendants of the locust or the palmer or cankerworm, giant Sitgo and Exxon signs smiled encouragement. Glancing down, I noticed a red coin of blood disfiguring the left knee of my chinos, and thinking this funny, I began to limp. Uh, and I'll finish with a, a cycling poem. I cycle around London, um, which is a great way of getting around. There's a reference here to Boris bikes, which you can probably guess are equivalent, our equivalent of city bikes. Our, our mayor, Boris Johnson, got to get his name attached to them. Um, uh, I think otherwise. It's called Under the Lime Trees, and I'd like to say uh, in advance, thank you so much for your attention. Under the Lime Trees. All that glitters is not glass, but lots and lots of it is, mused the helmeted cyclist. Oh, you fast spinning tires, so delicately ridged, so like the scales of a young crocodile. Avoid whatever sparkles and that straggle-haired woman weaving her way briskly against the traffic her hands a jiving blur as she belts out snatches of we're just two little girls from Little Rock, the one who broke my heart in Little Rock. Are these I spy the deserving poor, fully adrift, or breastfed bohemians, weird thought of the day, jostling on a street corner beside an all but emptied rack of Boris bikes? Wolves living on wind, sur le Noël, mort saison. We do not feel the speck of dust that alights on our shoulder, nor its fatal cousin, the germ we inhale, unknowing and cannot spit out. It slides through the unmapped city within. Responsive cells divide or move, suddenly restless, alert, driving, dragging from the abyss an image of myself, cowboy hatted, aged three, proudly astride an East African zebra. The spongy marrow buried in our bones enriches the blood that unites as it flows, nerve and muscle, tissue and tendon, propelling all smoothly forward like a river swirling over its unseen bed. While every active capillary, if challenged or opposed, or howsoever aroused, dilates in bold defiance, in outright scorn of the cold footsteps creeping like mist. Blink and click your heels, one, two, three, and the yellow brick road is thigh deep in nettles and willow herb. Even when it's invisible, the sun flings into space its gassy flames, each day enthrones itself, and we too must purge our minds of the inert and confining, dwell in thoughts that breathe and words that burn or shine brightly as a falling guillotine. Blink again and the fantastical flow of money and data bursts like a blood vessel, scattering the crowds gathered beneath the weeping limes. It happened I fell in with one kicking wildly at piles of sticky, heart-shaped leaves. His cheeks were furrowed with scars, and his left ear seemed torn. Follow, 
he confided, the scent to the vixen's lair. Take up your broken bicycle and with both hands hurl it as far, as far. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to share this evening with Helen Bendler and Mark Ford, and, and an honor to introduce John Ashbery. Also, I'd like to thank Bernard Schwartz for inviting me to help celebrate the publication of John's two volumes of collected French translations, which I have edited with my wife, the poet Roseanne Wasserman. Kenneth Koch once said, all poetry is a translation of feelings and perceptions that are in some ways unsayable. In his translations of French literature, Ashbery has simply but eloquently rendered the French writer's original feelings and perceptions in the language of imagination. His ability to give us these French works in English has always been tied to his own ready access to the realm of the unsayable, as is evident in this passage from Rambeau's after the flood, the beavers built, tumblers of coffee steamed in the public houses, in the vast still streaming house of windows, children in mourning looked at marvelous pictures. A door slammed and on the village square, the child waved his arms, understood by veins and weathercocks everywhere in the dazzling shower. Madame XXX established a piano in the Alps. Mass and First Communion were celebrated at the cathedral's 100,000 altars. Ashbery's contributions to French and world, and world, and world art and, and culture earned him the prestigious Officer of Arts and Letters Award from the French Legion of Honor in 2002. This new collected French translations confirms his central role in the interplay of a modern American French literary tradition as old as Baudelaire's championing of Edgar Allan Poe. In the UK, Ashbery's volume of poetry translations has already been chosen as the London, London Poetry Book Society's recommended translation for summer 2014. Quick question published in 2012 is Ashbery's 26th book of new poems, and a 27th is in the works with characteristically humorous and thoughtful titles such as Chafed Elbows, The Price of Eggs, East February. In London, The Guardian praised Quick Question's exhilarating changes and register its elusive journeys ambitious vocabulary, and more than anything else, its intoxicating sense of fun. The Telegraph noted that the echoes of Eliot indicate that the modernist example of poetic strangeness is still a live one. It's hard not to marvel at how prolific and how consistently enchanting Ashbery is, and yet I remember a time in the mid-80s as Roseanne and I were driving with John through Hudson, New York, when he sighed and rather ironically, as he sat in the back seat looking out at the gray sky, quoted T.S. Eliot from Ash Wednesday. Why should the aged eagle spread its wings? Because I quickly replied, we like to see you fly. He grinned and never mentioned it again. This this year alone, that year alone, he had just won a Bollingen Prize in Poetry and a Wallace Stevens Fellowship from Yale University, the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize from the Nation, the Commonwealth Award in Literature from the Modern Language Association, and a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. And was wondering what was next, or to echo the title of one of his own poems, how to continue 
His work in the following 25 years has taken his poetry to new heights and include the publication by the Library of America of the first volume of his work edited by Mark Ford, a National Book Foundation Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters, and a National Humanities Medal presented by President Barack Obama, a longtime reader of Ashbery's work who praised his ability to create new possibilities in verse. In fact, it seems that what is possible in poetry has always been one of Ashbery's greatest concerns. In his introduction to Some Trees, W.H. Auden says, it is not surprising that many modern po poems, among them Mr. Ashbery's, are concerned with the nature of the creative process. Writing about Marianne Moore's work, Ashbery himself says, only something like alchemy could account for the miracle of some of these poems. Of James Tate, he writes, the idea of the poet permanently at risk, splitting a world, seeing a new possibility each day, wading out into the swamp and seeing where it takes him, sounds to me very close to the actual act of writing poetry, which no one ever really comes close to describing. In Ashbery's essay titled, Frank O'Hara's Question, he says, O'Hara demonstrates that art is human willpower, deploying every means at its disposal to break through to a truer state than the present one. And he concludes that O'Hara's work is in the form of a heroic question, can art do this? Of his own work, Ashbery has said, on the whole, I feel that poetry is going on all the time inside, an underground stream. One can let down one's bucket and bring the poem back up. And I don't, and, and he says, I don't look on poems as closed works. I feel they're probably going on all the time in my head, and I occasionally snip off a, a length. And finally, he says, in quick question, as he explores the muse's unsayable realm, some angels seemed to teeter on the wooden fence. Were we all they knew? Or are we part of their mind cleansing ritual, necessary and discardable? Doesn't that make more sense? Ashbery has a few questions of his own for us. Hopefully, we can provide some answers. Please welcome John Ashbery. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Eugene. Thank you for that very nice introduction. And Mark, for your brilliant reading. It's wonderful to, to hear you read again. I'm going to read a few of the translations to begin with from of Max Jacob from his uh, uh, collection of short prose poems called Le, Le Corne à Day, or which, The Dice Cup in English. This uh, appeared in uh, 1917, I believe. Um, 
This one is called <coughs> The Spy's Memoirs. To have written to the Figaro that I stole a gun? Oh, the wretch. It's him, the owner of the hotel. My brother forgot his gun in a hotel in Paris. The owner took it and wrote to the Figaro that it was me. It's not hard to rectify this. You address a letter to the theatrical page in care of the man in the orchestra seat. Is it really worth the trouble? I shall leave the hotel. The bed is never made. Old women come into my room to make fun of my misery. The young chambermaids can't do anything except bare their shoulders. Have I ever stolen a gun? Poem in a style which is not mine, to thee, Baudelaire. Near a holly tree through whose leaves a town could be seen, Don Juan, Rothschild, Faust, and a painter were conversing. <clears throat> I have amassed an enormous fortune, Rothschild said, and since it has brought me no pleasure, I continue to accumulate, hoping to find again the joy my first million brought me. I have continued to seek love in the midst of misfortunes, said Don Juan. To be loved and not to love is torture, but I continued to seek love in the hope of finding the emotion of first love again. <clears throat> when I found the secret that made me famous, said the painter, I sought other secrets to occupy my mind. For these I was refused the fame that first one had brought me, and I returned to my old formula, despite the disgust it inspires in me. I gave up knowledge for happiness, said Faust, but I come back to knowledge, despite the fact that my methods are out of date, because there is no happiness except in seeking. Beside them was a young girl with a crown of artificial ivy who said, I am bored, I am too beautiful. And God spoke behind the holly tree. I know the universe, I am bored. <laughs> Poem. I shall call on you each morning, madame, until your son, the captain, returns from the colonies. It would be much easier to look in the almanacs to find out what day he will be here if you are so eager to see him. We entered the lady's house in her absence. My sister declared that she had beautiful furniture, a bed, a bed with inlaid ivory from which the ivory must have fallen. You see those beds everywhere. Besides, it isn't beautiful because it isn't antique. And it isn't antique because, look, here is the inlaid portrait of the lady's son. Don't use the lady's nail file. First, because you don't know how to use a nail file when it's made of ivory. Second, because one doesn't use the nail files of ladies when they're out. If she comes in, what will she say? If she says nothing, what will she be thinking? I shall say that I am waiting for her son, the captain, who is in the colonies. She will say that you are intruding in her house. She will throw you out and you'll have to go once more and drink alone on the cafe terraces. This is uh, called the Italian Straw Hat, which is the uh, title of a 19th century farce by La Biche about a, a uh, horse that eats a uh, valuable straw hat. <laughs> In the place where Algiers gives you a foretaste of Constantinople, the gold epaulettes were no longer anything but acacia branches and vice versa. The latest fashion is bunches of celluloid grapes. The women fasten them here and there like jewelry. A horse who ate the earrings of one of my fine friends died of poisoning, the carmine of his muzzle and the fucine of the grape constituting a deadly poison. The Rue Ravignon. This is a famous street uh, for artists in uh, Montmartre where the uh, Bateau Lavoir uh, buildings 
that how Jacob and Picasso and many others were, was rather. The Rue Ravignon, one does not bathe twice in the same stream, said the philosopher Heraclitus, yet it is always the same ones who mount the street. Always at the same time of day, they pass by, happy or sad. All of you passers-by of the Rue Ravignon, I have named you after the illustrious dead. There is Agamemnon. There is Madame Hanska. Ulysses is a milkman. When Patroclus appears at the end of the street, a pharaoh is beside me. Castor and Pollux are the ladies of the fifth floor. But thou, old rag picker, who come in the enchanted morning to take away the still living rubbish as I am putting out my good big lamp, thou whom I know not, mysterious and impoverished rag picker, I have given thee a celebrated and noble name. I have named thee Dostoevsky. Literary manners. When a group of gentlemen meets another group, it is rare that their greetings are not interspersed with smiles. When a group of gentlemen meets a gentleman, if there is one profoundly polite greeting, the greetings start to diminish, and sometimes the last member of the group offers no greeting. It seems that I wrote that you bit a woman's nipple and that blood flowed. If you believe I did it, why do you greet me? And if I thought that you had done it, would I greet you? We met in the home of a stout woman with a knitted cape. You shook my hand, but we found ourselves in the room where the night commode is, and you threw the cushions of the night commode at my head. These cushions were very 18th century. They say that I, too, threw cushions at you instead of exonerating myself. I don't know whether this is true. When my group meets you, if I am the last and don't greet you, don't think it's because of the business of the cushions. But if my group meets yours and if smiles are exchanged, don't think that any of them come from me. Time and tide wait for no man. When one of your friends makes an appointment with you, avoid the result of his insolence, premeditated or not, absence. Leave the place of your meeting before the hour agreed on. It's you who will have been insolent and honor will be safe. I remember it was at the Cubist school. There was a blackboard, a little black table, chalk. There was also some tented anger paper which Mr. K was supposed to lift. There was a student waiting there. The teacher didn't come. It was a student who left before the time of their appointment. The teacher came and left before the time of their appointment. Premeditation of insolence or not? Poo. Honor was safe on both sides. I noted in France that actually a lot of people subscribe to that theory. Um, the situation of maid servants in Mexico. The, invest the investigation of the situation of maid servants in Mexico, begun by the Mercure de France for the satisfaction of men of letters, preoccupies all of human thought. The illustrated supplement of the Petit Parisien shows the notorious Marie T in her slip at the moment when, in her attic room, she is attempting a supreme effort to dissimulate from her mistress a pile of utensils partly hidden by a dirty sheet. To the investigation of the Mercure de France, the servant's journal replies with a counter-investigation of employers, and we are told some fine tales. A certain Amélie B. had succeeded in hiding one of her anemic cousins in a Renaissance chest in the home of the M couple. The cousin was regularly visited by a doctor he was even quite demanding and complained of the noise in the house that certain poker parties prevented him from sleeping. Madame M, who conceals an illegal portion of her income in the chest, 
was obliged to tolerate the presence of the stranger. As for Mr. M, he is not unaware of the presence in the Renaissance chest of the anemic unemployed cousin, but if his dignity prevents him from offering Amélie's cousin a more comfortable lodging, his love for her, it is said, prevents him from expulsing from it him who occupies it. The editor of the Servant's Journal audaciously tries to make his literature equal that of the Mercure de France. He adds pertinently, if without great originality, that, quote, we are dependent on neither what we do not seem to depend on, nor what we wish to depend on, nor what we defend ourselves from depending on, and on which we nevertheless depend, but that we are dependent on ourselves. Furthermore, he adds, we are even more dependent on that which it seems that we do not depend at all. Thus is resolved the question of maidservants in Mexico. <laughs> the Beggar Woman of Naples. When I lived in Naples, there was always a beggar woman at the gate of my palace to whom I would toss some coins before climbing into my carriage. <laughs> One day, surprised at never being thanked, I looked at the beggar woman. Now as I looked at her, I saw what I had taken for a beggar woman was a wooden case painted green which contained some red earth and a few half-rotten bananas. Literature and Poetry. It was near Lorient, a city on the coast of Brittany. The sun shone brightly, and we used to go for walks, watching through those September days, the sea rising, rising to cover woods, landscapes, cliffs. Soon there was nothing left to combat the blue sea, but the meandering paths under the trees, and the families drew closer together. Among us was a child in a sailor's suit. He was sad and took me by the hand. Sir, he said, I have been in Naples. Do you know that in Naples there are lots of little streets? In the streets you can stay all alone without anyone seeing you. It's not that there are many people in Naples, but there are so many little streets that there is never more than one street for each person. What stories is the child telling you now, said the father. He has never been to Naples. <laughs> Sir, your child is a poet. That's all right, but if he is a man of letters, I'll wring his neck. <laughs> the meandering paths left dry by the sea had made him think of the streets of Naples. <laughs> the poet's house. He is dead. And here are his widow and two sons. It was at that window that we used to see his old man's profile. Alas, says the widow, a love match, so much courage and genius. Our parents consented to everything. The house has changed tenants. A woman has hung washing in the attic. I addressed her. She replied with broad jokes. An Alsatian dog glared at me. There were roses in the garden. They were faded. The tenants have changed again. There was a tile roof over the front steps and iced drinks were being sipped in the garden. What will be there next in the poet's house? Perhaps a crime? And you, poor little thing, what do you expect for your house unless it be the treason of your best friends? I'm going to read uh, some recent poems, <clears throat> not yet collected in a book. Uh, a, few, a few have appeared in magazines. The first one is called A Sweet Disorder, an allusion to Robert Herrick's uh, line of a sweet disorder in the dress is something to be desired. 
rather than to be all neatly buttoned up. Pardon my sarong. I'll have a Shirley Temple. <laughs> Certainly, sir. You want a cherry with that? I guess so. It's part of it, isn't it? Strictly speaking, yes. Some of them likes it, others not so much. Well, I'll have a cherry. I can be forgiven for not knowing it's de rigueur. In my commuter mug, please. Certainly. <laughs> he doesn't even remember me. It was a nice, beautiful day. One of your favorite foxtrots was on. Neckties they used to wear. You could rely on that. My gosh, it's already 7.30. Are these our containers? Pardon my past, because, you know, it was all like one piece. It can't have escaped your attention that I would argue. How is it supposed to look? Do I wake or sleep? East February. Out there, the air is moist. I can tell walking through it. Thank you so much for coming in. It's late, isn't it? Almost grotesque. My crew will be in touch. Not expecting friends that you don't know yet are coming. Foxtrot, performance art that I gaze on so fondly today. This hymn to dowdiness, howdy doody shaped. A mouse can show what works, even if no one knows why, he said. Listening tour. We were arguing about whether NBC was better than CBS. I said CBS because it's smaller and had to work harder to please viewers. You didn't like either that much, but preferred smaller independent companies. Just then an avalanche flew overhead. Light blew against the sky's determined violet. We started to grab our stuff, but it was too late. We segued. And in another era, the revolutions were put down by the farmers working together with the peasants and the enlightened classes. All benefited in some way. That was all I had to hear. Whatever. <laughs> A breakfast radish. I'm, I've heard that in France, people sometimes have radishes for breakfast, but I never saw an example of this or heard firsthand from anyone. <laughs> but it's a nice idea. <laughs> Whatever we're dealing with catches us in mid-reconsideration. It's beautiful, my lord, just not made to be repeated, that's all. Counter-terrorists have already invaded parts of England and Spain. Your action dollar at work. Deception figures in quite a few precious things, although, as I say, it's a small remnant of what others have achieved to avoid being singed. We have a special on revenge tragedy. March is going to be a heavier day. The girls talked about getting ready. When they do, in this or that glen, Looks can be deceiving, he stressed. Breezeway. Someone said we needed a breezeway to bark down remnants of Superstorm Elias jugularly. Alas, it wasn't my call. I didn't have a call or anything resembling one. You see, I have always been a rather dull-spirited winch. The days go by and I go with them. A breeze falls from a nearby tower, finds no breezeway, goes away along a mission to supersize red shutters. Alas, if that were only all, there is the children's belongings to be looked to. If only one can find the direction needed and stuff like that. I said we were all homers, not homos, but my voice dwindled in the roar of Hurricane Edsel. We have to live out our precise experimentation. Otherwise, there's no dying for anybody, no crisp rewards. 
Batman came out and clubbed me. He never did get along with my view of the universe, except, you know, existential threads from the time of the peace beaters and more. He patted his dog, Pastor Fido. There was still so much to be learned and even more to be researched. It was like a goodbye. Why not accept it anyhow? The mission girls came through the woods in their special suitings. It was all whipped cream and baklava. Is there a Batman somewhere who notices us and promptly looks away at a new catalog, say, or another racing car expletive coming back at him? Him is capitalized there. Um, <laughs> Wherever your son takes you, that's uh, S-U-N. Holy grail, Batman. Can't you see it? Ice cream fell on his arm when I went to explore and found students reading papers. Please join the opera about interesting things. Congressman, I was one of the reasons the troubled muse shuns its classical heritage, a, a positive negative voice. Russell Weed said to read it, and that's my weakness now. What kind of machine instructs his stiffening member? That would help. I don't think I know who he is. Like a disoriented codfish that drives out to get me. Did I mention cockchafers? I was quite different then, guilty of changing the money. Look, I, thanks, so you can do this at home on a whoopee calendar. But don't do that. Sleeping with naked eyebrows, they didn't realize they weren't modern, and such was the result. But he never forgot that day on the water. That and mutability issues, capiche? I was quite different then. Yes, I just remembered. She's going to be brutally named after you. His shadow is on the other door. What you see is what you get, neither more nor less but shapely. Ratcheting up the task forces, he'd hate yours. Tell me, I'd assumed you were a doctor, and it wasn't just the beautiful and exacting places. Worries, I had a few, but everything looked distinct in his calm lens. I kind of forgot why I was coming, what I wanted to say, in Indian August especially. Ripe stairs, staggered deaths, bored of humiliation, and they come in here, the ice saints, big time tumblers. She hardly touched her dinner, routine evangelism, full of the luck we had just inherited, the uncrazy things that happened on your doorstep. City of Bouncers. There's the speed of Golden Ivy, the city wing. A hundred this weekend, having wonderful meeting, not slamming, substantiated enough. Whether his feet, the not so air conditioned gent in the foyer invites you to a chop busting, that will patch up today's industrious pose till the paint dries. Yes. And what about you and your project? Afraid it'll grow beyond the sustainable frontier, just like your ma warned you back in the day when sisters alighted from planes looking breezy and collected? Putting it on the take with the haircut I just limbed, the event horizon ought to be in fine shape by tomorrow. Look, we just want to cancel our order. Is that such a big deal, Danny boy? Dans le métro. Uh, this has a, a, an epigraph from a uh, popular song by Charles Trenet, Hier de la Joie, which is Miracle son nom à la station Javel. Um, nameless miracle at the Javel station. Javel is a, a metro station in Paris, but it has rather dreary connotations since Javel is uh, 
bleach actually, which I think is manufactured in that neighborhood. We got in on the bottom line at Duck Alley, 10 feet of onions to hoe, and a disruptive sneeze blew in from the sissy aisles. What I hope to say, what I hope to say is, out here, west of the water tower, waggish, resourceful, you hardly walk away anymore. At one of the president's meetings, Miss Hazel to you, to oppose the new constitution, I thought you'd like to know about the pictures of the babysitter, tragic annals, rife again. I was thinking of Tuesday night and none of the background. I hope he feels good. Late in the house, watched by my grandmother's permanent low-grade calceolarias, sure to come back breathless, it's all set up. Strangers at a concession may find they missed the onion maze phase of the celebrity mashup. The open system showing its age, they said. Um, Seven-year-old Orach likes this. Orak, A-U-R-O-C-H, is, I believe, a, uh, an ancestor of the, the ox, maybe prehistoric, not sure. Will research tell us tomorrow of normal morals? Take a Brooklyn family in fracture mode, vivid, energizing, throbs to the earlobes, Thanks to a snakeskin toupee, my grayish push boots exhale new patina slash prestige. Exeunt the Kardashians. Exit the emergency room. A nifty looking broad goes up to a goofy guy. There is the leader with its bow. Well, I wouldn't do it instantly. I'll bring you some. Uh, and well, I'm dried. Antique mud wrestlers shape up for the last time. No scuttling of vain things left undone. When you get back, I'll just hit another menu, safe as a can of soup in a mini mart. Saw you first on Masterpiece Theater. I used to climb right in. That was funny, yet unbidden. When you were alive, they called him a stooge. My voice to young adolescents is like, whom do you know? hiding their accomplishments in bread. We'll keep on looking for birds of prey. Sunbonnet Sioux ought to be learning, lurking, flinging bridges across enormous spaces the way the Druids did, perhaps Ottomans, now that they've shrunk. Mine's the control and I must deal with it. Had a little discussion, benches throughout for safety. We walked all the way here in the 18th century. Century of closures. I'm not sure of that, though. Begin marinating and be out of here a whole bunch. Oh, melted butter. The devalued sun looks up other people's calisthenics like that's going to change anything. Close himself to waking up. Bodies not noticed. As for the father, well, he'll become hybrid like most of us who you walk along in grayness against. The salt has lost its savior, j'accuse. <laughs> this is a prose poem called The Dream of a Rarebit Fiend which is the title of a, an early commons, comic strip by the uh, cartoonist who invented Little Nemo, whose name I can't think of at the moment, who also did uh, some animated movies. And he did a movie called The Dream of a Rarebit Fiend. Rarebit was supposed to give you awful nightmares, apparently. The 50-foot old masterpiece that awful necklace, is that good for you? I mean, do you like it any better? Tree stumps? Oh, Mr. Saltina, dear, it's good before anything else is. 
Mr. Saltina is a character in the novel, The Young Visitors by the a, a young girl, uh, Daisy Ashford, a, a charming uh, fantasy uh, S-A-L-T-E-E-N-A. -E -E oh, Mr. Saltina, dear, it's good before anything else is. We're not opening today. Her intentional steel embrace scuttled it, which is not to say you're not to proceed. On the contrary, we like you more than when we were at school, we and they. There are good times in everybody's satchel, nor do we all get a free pass. That would be a split decision, as they call it. How else is the planned brotherhood to float forward? Watch her, she'll donate a medal to the crowd for a flag. It's why we call each other members. If we can get this stuff out of here, a little bit more power and the shins will come to seem appropriate. That's your cue. Don't let on I was here helping with the tables sometimes. Ah, it was awful the way they rushed him past us and a few stragglers. We had been told to meet up with Destiny at a corner of the fairgrounds, a pearl and fragments. It's so fun, a dollop here, a mess of particles there. Not everyone sees it as you do, which is right for them, no matter what territory they own, and at times wander back to, unthinking, forgetting if a lurid sky can be just one thing or under certain conditions definitive. Why, I never, Um, a couple more. The Pie District. This is what we need to do at a certain point. Wait for it, FND. Examine cheesy knockoffs of dubious provenance. Are we ready to help yet? Four ne negatives make a positive. I even joined City Hall. Waves of attentiveness and straight A's followed, but I was so crestfallen, the ship's little dog seemed to think so. It hung around impetuously. They're the ones to get somebody to do things, pick up after him. We'll see who finishes soon, in shock. There was nothing not to like about the new self-monitoring system, yet strangely, the Pi District voted against it. I, however, custodian of Song Froid, made a 180 degree swivel. The Bandonian keeps its goofy elixir locked in its dark depths. Thank you, by the way. I saw the daughter of his king and illustrator, Mrs. Walter H. Brown, streaking past the hedges sparkling with dew, just as if it were another time. Lizzie, Lizzie Brown, I stammered, but she took no notice of me or the hundred or so other guests gathered on the lawn to salute spring. This is ominous, and yet I managed to gasp. I'll have more of it for breakfast. Two things that went up and never came back. I don't understand. That must have been about drinking, feline intrigue. Can I go to my doctor now? The fan kids still chewing on a Fifth Avenue bar, which they may not make anymore, with or without Tood. It's been three years now. That's just it. We don't know. Do it the hard way, and we go out and visit. I'll read two more. This one is called Dickie's Border Vacation. No one knows whether I should stay here with you. The comics became devoted after his mother died. Cross mentoring, peer checking, peer coaching were brought on with beans and leftovers. Like most books, this one puts a damper on me. On Sundays, I used to populate they were running out of steam but didn't know it. Now we like it. 
My face is too young. Later, politics would trample our undeveloped theses. Professor, I'm going to set you up again. Don't wheeze next time. Railroad elders would border on the interesting. What of Lepchek, Spongy, Mr. John Johnson, Hunts Hall? These and others swept to their doom over the solid seeming railing, make for clouded sailing ahead. I'm going to start working on it or the other. A rumble upstate said, no, they're not. I told them 8,600 times. You, get enough, you got enough feet to refer to with mixed success. A drop in pressure, wine and fripperies is what I can do for you, drab gent. Do you want to eat those sunny idle cakes? If I can get a cancellation to feign grand illness, alas, he likes to take care of each other. And I think, I really do think that a poultice, hey, I've been hungry for two seconds. You're staying without a gift. A lot of liquid from Latin hands will trickle down to the strange Oz house I affirmed to get out of business. Morning glories, poppies, and they keep saying they want to hire. Me, oh, I saw him throwing a glass of water around, told him not to participate. Whom did you involve? The Alps are for women, strictly speaking. It is definitely possible in the Slovak station to not be too sorry for her or she would be putting up with it. Well, you don't want it to. Perhaps no outcome, but impeccably located, shocking images in forests of creosote making an event possible. It's special loaded with mine ships for the tri-state area. Dirt all election day. We made so much money, this is almost on the house. It was 1910. And this last one is a prose poem. Be careful what you wish for. And the title runs into the first line. Be careful what you wish for, exurb. What were you driving at when you said, used to joke I'm in the retirement business. The snow is beginning to fall again. I'm wondering whether I should go out. How can you give orders when nobody is listening? A friend, a friend and two boys. Here where love was quiet, it was possible to think discontinuously of the folds ahead. Faith on a tricycle. Only it or she got a hole in her dress. It was a million to one, it was something bad. The windows rattled as the train swept through at breakfast. You may want to rethink that decision, bother the others. It was right there in his military book. You would have two Oracle Snow. You knew that, everybody did. My dynasty, confessions of a lily from wire. That was a terrible thing to do purely naked. Groveling conditions apply, not to go all agony ant on you. You're not ready for this. No poet is, only you already came. The crane doesn't know if the weather will return. I don't want it. I don't give a shit. Something that would have fell. The potato orchard with attached oriental kitchen. They don't say please in heaven. All business is carried out in the pre-noon hours leaving time for naps and reflection. This is the kind of life, life I was supposed to lead. What happened, you ask? Cutie pie went bye-bye. Once the hypnotic hour of 12 has struck, you are like any other paying guest, waiting for the intoxicating smell of burgers to waft up the stairway. When Doc moved back to our area, he noticed the wretched smiles, legacy of our previous god. Who, he wondered, enjoys this kind of ambience? And sure enough, it was Independence Day. And word went out, it's the right day but the wrong month. Go back to sleep. And they did, writing in the grass. The fuller brush man, clean jawed, stopped by. See you down there. Let me know. Just because Scooby-Doo thinks you should. Dirt officials implied a small little bomb and sleep, trying to find them. Now I approve not just Initiative A43, but the whole dumb panoply, Uncle Ralph. 
Sign me up for festooned. They say she was last seen by a lake crying. You knew that. Everybody did. Thanks. Thank you.